Chapter 11 of How to Live on 24 Hours a Day by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 Serious Reading. Novels are excluded from serious reading, so that the man who, bent on self improvement, has been deciding to devote ninety minutes three times a week to a complete study of the works of Charles Dickens will be well advised to alter his plans. The reason is not that novels are not serious. Some of the great literature of the world is in the form of prose fiction. The reason is that bad novels ought not to be read, and that good novels never demand any appreciable mental application on the part of the reader. It is only the bad parts of Meredith's novels that are difficult. A good novel rushes you forward like a skiff down a stream, and you arrive at the end, perhaps breathless, but unexhausted. The best novels involve the least strain. Now, in the cultivation of the mind, one of the most important factors is precisely the feeling of strain, of difficulty, of a task which one part of you is anxious to achieve, and another part of you is anxious to shirk and that feeling cannot be got in facing a novel. You do not set your teeth in order to read Anna Karenina. Therefore, though you should read novels, you should not read them in those ninety minutes. Imaginative poetry produces a far greater mental strain than novels. It produces probably the severest strain of any form of literature. It is the highest form of literature. It yields the highest form of pleasure and teaches the highest form of wisdom. In a word, there is nothing to compare with it. I say this with sad consciousness of the fact that the majority of people do not read poetry. I am persuaded that many excellent persons, if they were confronted with the alternatives of reading Paradise Lost and going round Trafalgar Square at noonday on their knees in sackcloth, would choose the ordeal of public ridicule. Still, I will never cease advising my friends and enemies to read poetry before anything. If poetry is what is called a sealed book to you, begin by reading Hazlitt's famous essay on the nature of poetry in general. It is the best thing of its kind in English, and no one who has read it can possibly be under the misapprehension that poetry is a medieval torture, or a mad elephant, or a gun that will go off by itself and kill at forty paces. Indeed, it is difficult to imagine the mental state of the man who, after reading Hazlitt's essay, is not urgently desirous of reading some poetry before his next meal. If the essay so inspires you, I would suggest that you make a commencement with purely narrative poetry. There is an infinitely finer English novel, written by a woman, than anything by George Eliot or the Brontes or even Jane Austen, which perhaps you have not read. Its title is Aurora Lee, and its author is E. B. Browning. It happens to be written in verse, and to contain a considerable amount of genuinely fine poetry. Decide to read that book through, even if you die for it. Forget that it is fine poetry. Read it simply for the story and the social ideas. And when you have done, ask yourself honestly whether you still dislike poetry. I have known more than one person to whom Aurora Lee has been the means of proving that in assuming they hated poetry they were entirely mistaken. Of course, if after Hazlitt, and such an experiment made in the light of Hazlitt, you are finally assured that there is something in you which is antagonistic to poetry, you must be content with history or philosophy. I shall regret it, yet not inconsolably. The decline and fall is not to be named in the same day with Paradise Lost, but it is a vastly pretty thing. And Herbert Spencer's First Principles simply laughs at the claims of poetry and refuses to be accepted as aught but the most majestic product of any human mind. 
I do not suggest that either of these works is suitable for a trio in mental strains. But I see no reason why any man of average intelligence should not, after a year of continuous reading, be fit to assault the supreme masterpieces of history or philosophy. The great convenience of masterpieces is that they are so astonishingly lucid. I suggest no particular work as a start. The attempt would be futile in the space of my command, but I have two general suggestions of a certain importance. The first is to define the direction and scope of your efforts. Choose a limited period, or a limited subject, or a single author. Say to yourself, I will know something about the French Revolution, or the rise of railroads, or the works of John Keats. And during a given period, to be settled beforehand, confine yourself to your choice. There is much pleasure to be derived from being a specialist. The second suggestion is to think as well as read. I know people who read and read, and for all the good it does them, they might just as well cut bread and butter. They take to reading as better men take to drink. They fly through the shires of literature on a motor car, their sole object being motion. They will tell you how many books they have read in a year. Unless you give at least forty-five minutes to careful, fatiguing reflection, it is an awful bore at first, upon what you are reading. Your ninety minutes of a night are chiefly wasted. This means that your pace will be slow. Never mind. Forget the goal. Think only of the surrounding country, and after a period, perhaps when you least expect it, you will suddenly find yourself in a lovely town on a hill. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of How to Live on Twenty-Four Hours a Day by Arnold Bennett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12 Dangers to Avoid I cannot terminate these hints, often I fear too didactic and abrupt, upon the full use of one's time to the great end of living as distinguished from vegetating without briefly referring to certain dangers which lie in wait for the sincere aspirant towards life. The first is the terrible danger of becoming the most odious and least supportable of persons, a prig. Now a prig is a pert fellow who gives himself airs of superior wisdom. A prig is a pompous fool who has gone out for a ceremonial walk and without knowing it has lost an important part of his attire, namely his sense of humor. A prig is a tedious individual who, having made a discovery, is so impressed by his discovery that he is capable of being gravely displeased because the entire world is not also impressed by it. Unconsciously, to become a prig is an easy and a fatal thing. Hence, when one sets forth on the enterprise of using all one's time, it is just as well to remember that one's own time, and not other people's time, is the material with which one has to deal, that the earth rolled on pretty comfortably before one began to balance a budget of the hours, and that it will continue to roll on pretty comfortably whether or not one succeeds in one's new role of Chancellor of the Exchequer of Time. It is as well not to chatter too much about what one is doing, and not to betray a too pained sadness at the spectacle of a whole world deliberately wasting so many hours out of every day, and therefore never really living. It will be found, ultimately, that in taking care of oneself, one has quite all one can do. Another danger is the danger of being tied to a program like a slave to a chariot. One's program must not be allowed to run away with one. It must be respected, but it must not be worshipped as a fetish. 
a program of daily employ is not a religion. This seems obvious. Yet I know men whose lives are a burden to themselves and a distressing burden to their relatives and friends simply because they have failed to appreciate the obvious. Oh, no! I have heard the martyr's wife exclaim. Arthur always takes the dog out for exercise at eight o'clock, and he always begins to read at a quarter to nine, so it's quite out of the question that we should, etc., etc. And the note of absolute finality in that plaintive voice reveals the unsuspected and ridiculous tragedy of a career. On the other hand, a program is a program, and unless it is treated with deference, it ceases to be anything but a poor joke. To treat one's program with exactly the right amount of deference, to live with not too much and not too little elasticity, is scarcely the simple affair it may appear to the inexperienced. And still another danger is the danger of developing a policy of rush, of being gradually more and more obsessed by what one has to do next. In this way, one may come to exist as in a prison, and one's life may cease to be one's own. One may take the dog out for a walk at eight o'clock and meditate the whole time on the fact that one must begin to read at a quarter to nine and that one must not be late. And the occasional, deliberate breaking of one's program will not help to mend matters. The evil springs not from persisting without elasticity in what one has attempted, but from originally attempting too much, from filling one's program till it runs over. The only cure is to reconstitute the program and to attempt less. But the appetite for knowledge grows by what it feeds on, and there are men who come to like a constant breathless hurry of endeavor. Of them it may be said that a constant breathless hurry is better than an eternal doze. In any case, if the program exhibits a tendency to be oppressive, and yet one wishes not to modify it, an excellent palliative is to pass with exaggerated deliberateness from one portion of it to another. For example, to spend five minutes in perfect mental quiescence between chaining up the St. Bernard and opening the book. In other words, to waste five minutes with the entire consciousness of wasting them. The last and chiefest danger which I would indicate is one to which I have already referred, the risk of a failure at the commencement of the enterprise. I must insist on it. A failure at the commencement may easily kill outright the newborn impulse toward a complete vitality, and therefore every precaution should be observed to avoid it. The impulse must not be overtaxed. Let the pace of the first lap be even absurdly slow, but let it be as regular as possible. And having once decided to achieve a certain task, achieve it at all costs of tedium and distaste. The gain in self-confidence of having accomplished a tiresome labor is immense. Finally, in choosing the first occupations of those evening hours, be guided by nothing whatever but your taste and natural inclination. It is a fine thing to be a walking encyclopedia of philosophy. But if you happen to have no liking for philosophy, and to have a like for the natural history of street cries, much better leave philosophy alone and take to street cries. End of chapter 12 End of How to Live on 24 Hours a Day by Arnold Bennett This book recorded by Phil Chenevere